Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Zero, six, All right. Seven, well, uh, I'm not very nervous because the place is quite empty, so thank goodness it's not. Anyway, uh, just to let you know, uh, how many of you are okay? Or how many of you need me to try to speak in Bahasa? Just put up your hands. Only one. No, that one doesn't count. You are with Pekeso. You, I could get you fired. All right. All right. Uh, let me give you a big background, a bit of background about myself. I've been in Pekeso just over two years. I came into transformation because I come from a management consulting background. I spent over maybe about 25 years. I worked for uh, as a management consultant and systems integrator, I was with, uh, spent a bit of time with Accenture, uh, Halliburton, and my last job when I retired about two and a half years ago was with IBM. I was the general manager in IBM. And then after retirement, I was asked to, if I would be interested to do, to serve, instead of chasing for profits, to serve the like, national service. So I said, why not come to Pekeso? So I've been here. And it has been quite an exciting thing. Now, after Muihan's session, which was really excellent, I said, I better say, hey, don't rush out to go and post, 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 post in LinkedIn. You need content. You need to be employable. And not just to create the visibility about your employability. So this book struck my attention. I think it came to the market about... This book called Blue Ocean, it came out uh, developed by these two uh, people who worked very renowned uh, academicians in the INSEAD institution in Europe. And they talked about, they, they set it up, they wrote this book about Blue Ocean. What is Blue Ocean? It was originally intended for people in, who were in business, whether it's employers or whatever, because if you're looking for business, let's say you're out in the ocean of opportunity. You're looking for business, you're looking for food. Now, if you are competing, whatever is the resources in that part of the ocean you're swimming in where you are looking for business, it's limited. Where you can be is limited by what you can do. And how much business you can get is limited by the number of people fighting for that food. So if you have limited ability, because that's where you can play, that's where you can swim, and a lot of people are like you, fighting for this limited, very limited amount of food, the food will get taken up more and more, and then the fish will, instead of when you are fighting each other for the business, you will start biting in, into each other. What happens when you bite into each other's flesh? There's going to be blood. And then it's going to get bloody. Then the ocean becomes red. So if you're fighting for business in a red ocean, you're not going to make a lot of money. You might just die. So what's the alternative? We have seen National Geographic uh, documentaries and all that. You've seen some beautiful oceans, some beautiful terrain and all that. It is hard, to, the, the, the ones, the blue oceans, the nice mountains and all that, they are hard to access, correct? The more difficult to access, the more beautiful it is, and the resources there are fantastic. The plants can grow, the animals can grow, the hunters can't go hunt them so easily, and it's blue. And the oceans there are really blue, the fishes there are really big. If you don't believe, Ask people who work offshore on the oil platforms. Uh, well, there are oil platforms in, for West Malaysia uh, off the east coast of Trangganu, Kerte. They are 250 kilometers into the South China Sea. What sort of fishes go there? Or can be there? It's tough to get there. But they are there. There's very little competition. The fishes are huge. I've been offshore. I worked offshore before. The garupas are this long and they are not crunchy. They are really, really nice to eat. So, and the fishermen that go there, you need very high powered boats because your boat must go out 250 kilometers and be able to come back. 
And if you fish during the monsoon, your boat must be able to withstand 12 foot, 15 foot waves out in the open sea, for example, in the South China Sea. But the blue ocean is hard to get to. It is, but the food there is plentiful. You can eat to your heart's content. So originally, that was the original intention of the book, for people to look for businesses. So when I looked at it, and then after being in Pekeso, I said, when we were putting together this program, I said, how do we help people become more employable? Because as we know, there's no secret. And unemployability is really high. Uh, what, we have over 100,000 unemployed graduates? Zero, you want to work, zero, but the jobs are less and less available. Zero, because, and then if, you are, if the 100,000 is now, in a few months' time, another 50,000 are going to join the ranks of job seekers. Hopefully not the unemployed. Now, then what happens to the employment market? It's getting smaller. The employment market becomes then a red ocean if everybody's fighting for the same finite jobs. So now my message to job seekers, and I don't mean just the fresh graduates, job seekers also relate to the people manning the booths. Okay, if you're in government agency, you might not get fired. But if you don't up your capability, your employability, you're not going to get promoted, you're not going to get very employable. You won't have many opportunities to do so. So even the Red Ocean Strategy, although it is an old book, it is very relevant to the world still because it's just one of those timeless books. And that's my personal belief. So today, my objective is to point out for employability, you have, you're, as a job seeker, whether you're an unemployed person, we graduate, or somebody who got laid off, especially in the last two years, jobs have disappeared. And some jobs will never come back. So, how are you going to charit makan? Where are you going to charit makan? Hopefully, at the end of this hour, you would have some point perspectives as to how you can try to get to an ocean that is bluer, if there's such a word, so that it's easier for you not just to find a job to charit makan, but to really have gratification and satisfaction from your job. Of course, we all need to feed ourselves first. If you go to Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you start with, you have no food, you can forget about self-esteem and all these fine, nice things. But if you have food to eat, you will want to get to the next level and the next and the next and the next. To be able to get higher, you really need to move to a bluer and bluer ocean and not just for today. You could have a great job today. But could you tell, can you tell if a, a pandemic is going to hit, some strange virus is coming and it's going to wipe you out. There, were so many, there are so many, uh, I think that we are all in KL, you go to any mall, there are shops which are no longer in existence. Last week, my wife and I went to Wan Utama. We, went to, we wanted to look for uh, old, uh, old Asia Cafe. It was a cafe I patronized for the ten, last 10 years. I was in IBM. The office was in Wan Utama. Full every day. We, we had to plan what time we got down from the lift. Otherwise, there's no food. We can't even get into the restaurant, Old Asia. And guess what? Old Asia has closed. Because the two big tenants in the tower, KPMG and IBM Tower, IBM and KPMG, there are what? About 5,000 employees there. And in the last two years, you'll be lucky if 500 of them work in the office. So the market is gone. Old Asia is gone. Oriental cravings is gone. And God knows what else is gone. And there are many... Bothered up, bothered up, bothered up, bothered up. Kedai, tukaran akan datang. So that is very scary. So now, before you go, for those of you who are looking for jobs, you're unemployed, I, what Muihan did was excellent, but don't rush out first. Don't post hot air. You've got to post content. 
Now, how do we get ourselves to be more employable? Now, let me figure out this clicker. All right. One of the most important things is this. In this corner here, if you're a job seeker, are you one of many or do you stand out? Do you have the X factor? Example, are you reliable? Can you get things done? Really, is your whole orientation when somebody talks to you, do you have an attitude of customer service? Unless you are a hermit, unless you work from home completely on your own, you have to have a customer service mindset. So, do you have that? And so on and so forth. And attitude is a very big thing. How do you differentiate yourself? Experience, communication skills, language ability. And when we were planning this session, I asked the, the team, should I speak in Bahasa or should I speak in English? Obviously, after 25 years in the multinationals, my spoken Bahasa is not very good uh, as an understatement. Even though I had a distinction for Bahasa in my MCE, I'm that old. But I said, I would like to speak in English because if you can't understand me, you have a problem. You are not going to be able to work with the multinationals if you can't understand me. So, I challenge you today. If you have a language problem, don't walk out on this room. Don't turn your back and go look for some other job. I would challenge you to say, how can I up my language skills so that I can understand that old guy or people like the old guy up on stage right now. And that's my excuse for speaking English, by the way. So, there are many dimensions here. And very often... Um, when I was in IBM, I was involved in the recruitment for a few years of the Team Blues. The Team Blues are the elite in IBM for fresh graduates. Uh, minimum requ entry required, not entry. To get an interview, the minimum is a CGPA of 3.5. And then people started coming to CGPA of 3.5 and I was really disappointed in the candidate. I told the candidates, the number of candidates, I told HR, I don't want 3.5 anymore. I want 3.8. And we got a bunch of them. They were really good. But to get into a Team Blue as well, you need to have the, pass the IBM aptitude test for the consulting division. The pass mark is 70%. The accountants can come in at 40% because they don't have to do the kind of work the consultants do. So that is how difficult it is. So in the interviews for Team Blue, I don't even look at the results. Because the results got them into the interview room. It's not my job to look at the results anymore. There was a HR uh, screener. So what do I do? I look for differentiators. Every time somebody came to me and started telling me what's in my website, I say, look, I've been more than 10 years in this firm. Don't tell me something that I live every day and something you read last night. Tell me something about you. What are you going to be differentiating yourself with? Do you know I'm interviewing 25 of you today? I'm only going to hire five. All five of you have 3.5 or 3.8 and above. So why should you hire? Why should I hire you? And some of them just go, ah, and I was a mean guy. I mean, if the guy's a lousy candidate, I terminated the interview after five minutes. And the guy was said, or oh, somebody said, oh, Mr. Paul. Oh, you are really mean. You terminated me. I came all the way from Tamalo for this interview. I said, learn your lesson. If you want to work for one of the best IT companies in the world, you better bring value to me. I'm, this is not Christmas. I'm not Santa Claus. I'm not here to throw money and give it to you. So I said, I spent 10 minutes talking to the guy to say, you should ask yourself what value you're going to bring to this firm. I've got money to give to the right guy, but why should I give it to you? And there was one guy who was, I said, okay, do you have $100 with you? He said, no. I said, if you did, can, I just, can you give it to me? He said, why should I? I said, good. Why should I give you 3,500 ringgit a month? If you don't deserve it. I only asked for $100 and you're asking me for 3,500. Who has to convince who? That they are better for the job, right? So uh, tough to be interviewed by 
old timers like me, but you know why we see a lot of candidates? And sometimes we just want to make it fast and see who is actually good. So what the employers are looking for, if I can just put an acronym, easy to rem remember, would be ask. The attitude, the skills, and the knowledge. And those are the kind of things that we were looking for in terms of employability. Like I said, I never asked, I have never interviewed, I think I've interviewed maybe 300, 400 people in, the last, in those years before I left IBM. And I have never opened the academic transcripts of any candidate because that was for screening purposes. And if a candidate came into an interview room expecting to get a job because their guy got first-class honours, so are the other 25 candidates. So I don't look at what's a prerequisite. I look at what you need. And what, do we, what were we looking for? Zero, six, three, eight. It's how a person appears to the prospective employer. And even for those who are employed, you have jobs. We'll, we'll come to some starts, uh, uh, start, uh, slides this shortly after this. I have only six slides. How do you continuously reinvent yourself, improve and transform yourself so that even the boss that you go to and see every morning, every three months, the boss will say, hmm, your boss should be able to notice every three months that you are changing. I've got a few guys who are reporting to me here and they know I'm a pain in the ass to work with because I don't ask me if you do something very well. After three months, that's expected. It's just like buying a car. Anybody expects your car to have less than two mirrors. The wing mirrors, left and right. Anybody expects no uh, one mirror only? No, right? When I, I first had my driving license at the end of 1976, that's how old I am. In 1976, a lot of the cars had only one mirror. So when you got a second mirror, it was a big deal. After the mirrors, what were we looking for? Can you put a small fan on the dashboard? You ask somebody to do some drilling, pull wires here and there, and a fan. Hum, come on, if I put anybody in a the fan, there's people wearing those blue uniforms there, put them anybody with a car in a fan, they will run away. Aircon is a given. So, job is the same. Ishrock, you do a good job now. I expect the car to be aircon. I expect this. I expect that. So what you think is great today is what I expect as a baseline. So if you work for me in transformation, you better come up with something better every few months. So even uh, for the, those who are employed who have got cushy jobs here, my colleagues in Perkeso who probably don't need to worry about being fired, are you reinventing yourself? Do you have the misfortune of reporting to somebody like me who's looking for something different all the time. Uh, I, that's the nature of my business in transformation. So if you're in operations, uh, any operations people here? Okay, they're not here. So operations guys, I am not talking like your boss, and so it's a different thing. Now let's move on. So to this one. Now this is a, one of the most important models in Blue Ocean, which is your strategy canvas or your value curve. When you go for an interview, you need to know what are your attributes that you're offering. Academic, extracurricular activities, have you volunteered for anything, language, attitude, problem solving, and I put there MTH because I didn't want to cloud. MTH means acronym for make things happen. Can you make things happen? Because in the interview, I test for those things. So, let me give you an example of two types of candidates. Let's have the smart guys that I used to see. The one in this orange red thing. Academic top student. So, this side is impressive, no impact. So, if you are a straight A student, you are up here. But I know a lot of straight A students because uh, when I studied in University Malaya, we never talked to them because their mothers will still come bring them lunch and all these things. Uh, they hang around in the library. They don't know how to have fun. 
and they don't know if this toilet is full, where the second toilet is. They were so nerdy, we thought they were useless. So because they never got involved in any extracurricular activity, they never organized any seminar in school, so they didn't have to tell the VIP, sir, this toilet is full, go there. It's a simple thing like toilet, you'd be surprised how many people went through university and didn't know that there were some toilets under the certain staircases. And who didn't know? The straight A students. I'm just having fun. If you're a smart kid who is very, uh, who knows how to live life, I apologize. But for those who spend all their life working towards a CGPA of 4.0, chances are you never had time to volunteer. And language, hmm. smart kids, usually the parents, nowadays parents are very kiasu. Lah. English and Malay, Bahasa, you have to do in school. Very kiasu, send to Chinese school so that you have three languages. So the smart kids will be very good. And today, everybody wants to go to China to work because there's big money there, 1 billion people at 1.3 billion. So you might be good. Now, Attitude is a thing which I found which was a drawback for Team Blues. Because they're smart kids, they had, okay, like some of them are blessed, gifted with very high IQ. They never had to fix any problem in the world. All they need to do is go to the class, sit down, pay attention, read the books, go to the exam, get 100 marks. So it's not that they have a bad attitude. They never had a chance to demonstrate that they were good attitudes. And because it is not developed, you take your 4.0 CGPA, you go for an interview, you pass the aptitude test in IBM, for example. The, the, aptitude, the IBM test is actually just a high-end IQ test. Lah. You pass the test, you go in. You have never had to had a can-do attitude because life was very easy for you. Do you think in that five minutes you can change from a smart kid who was not challenged to demonstrate strong attitudes, etc., etc. Do you think you can go there and suddenly become the can-do guy? Do you think you can do like the... I, I love the uniform units. Because in schools, they got no money. But every time it's sports day or this carnival, that carnival, the sergeant or whatever will have to do the impossible. Make a makeshift bed out of nothing. The entrance to the, the school, well, the scouts will have to put up the very impressive facade. The teacher gives them $5 and they have to put up something very, very impressive. And that actually helps to build their attitudes a lot. So the smart kids don't have that. So likewise, if they are smart, they didn't have to solve many problems. And they never had to make things happen. Now, in comparison... The guy who chose to spend time under the coconut tree, lepa a lot, he and Della, got his basics done. A lot of ECAs. In, in this, I blame the school teachers. La. They never asked the smart students to do the work because these fellows got to report that they are the 10A students so that it goes into the newspapers. So the teachers leave them alone to study. The non-straight A students get to do all the other things. But, in the interview thing, what uh, Muihan was talking about, when you put up your experiences and all these things, these guys score very highly. Make things happen? Oh! Piece of cake for the guys who have been doing everything. So now let me ask you a question. A and B. Zero, seven, three, nine. Who is the more valuable employee? If you're looking for the scientist, A is a, maybe you might have to hire the scientist. But looks like most of us here are employed. I don't, I don't see the students here. So ask the lot of you, and you can put up your hands. When you are hiring, if you have these two candidates, how many of you would pick your A? Put up your hands. How many of you would pick B? All right, some haven't decided, but from the show of hands, B is a thing. So, what it means is, employability far transcends the academic dimension. Because the, the, what a candidate offers as employability is perceived as 
value. The employer is looking for potential value of a candidate. Now, if a candidate has all these attributes, and they, in fact, some of these candidates today have done more than what I've been through in many years of my life. I mean, Ishraq here, is, Ishraq, can you just show who you are? I've been mentioning your name. Ishraq has a good friend who studied with him in the UK. His name is Iman. Iman was organizing things in, for the student body in the UK uh, for events, especially when big shots wanted to come and all these things. So Ishraq could handle protocol, Ishraq could handle events, and can, could do, Ishraq could do a lot of things without any budget. And then the, the booth at Brad, there's a Cyberdyne there, the CEO of the, that uh, subsidiary is our rehab facility, Datuk Dr. Hafiz. He said, oh, I'm going to take him. So Ishraq gets a promotion after two years in Perkeso and he, he gets taken to rehab because Ishraq is a guy who can make things happen. Uh, Iman, Iman, oh, Ishraq. Oh, sorry. Okay, you have to do that now. So Iman is a guy who got hired. So anyway, long story short, the perceived value is extremely important. Because you may not, a fresh graduate may not have the track record for delivery. So how? In fact, a straight A student, probably the value of the academic materials, it's only less than 5%. I'll just share with you, my academic degree is in English literature. I spent my whole life in IT. I accidentally passed an IBM aptitude test, went to work in IT, and then I said, how the heck am I going to compete with the other IT graduates? Okay, I could learn to code. Lah. Coding is quite fun. My maths used to be quite good, so I can code. But after one month, two months, I know only one language. And the computer science graduate comes out and says, oh, I know. Blah, blah, blah. The joker knows 10 languages. I know one. So I said, every three months, I learn one. The flow has completed three programs. So I had to go and find other things to do. Uh, today is not a story about me, so I had to go and find so that I projected a value that was different to my boss. And the, the, the joke is this. After two years, I came in in a cohort of 10 people. After two years, all the other nine, computer science, mathematics, and physics graduates, they all reported to me. So they went to the boss. They wanted to have a strike. Went to the boss and said, boss, why is Paul our boss? The boss said, you did everything you, uh, we did everything we asked. Yeah, but he said, when I need something that is out of the ordinary, this joker gets it done. So I got promoted and all of them reported to me. I didn't check on their programming because I couldn't spell one end of the program from the other, but I could make things happen. So that was my personal experience. Another model for this. So if a person knows, I mean, the purpose of this session is to introduce some of these models from Blue Ocean. Okay, you know you have to have a value proposition represented by a value curve if you can plot it out. But what goes into the value curve? How do you know what to improve? Just now, Mohan said, you've got to tell people what you're doing. You've got to tell people what to do. You've got to tell, what do I do? And the next model, within the same book, the authors of the book created the six-path framework. How do you look across and see where the ocean could be blue? Where do you start with? And you look out, I'm going to pick just three examples here. You look across alternative industries. What else is happening in the rest of the world? You may not be so familiar, but how could this work for me? You look across, or within the, even if it's within your industry group, a very strategic group. For instance, if you've got a son and daughter that's done medicine, and there's a long queue, to get a job, a good job in medicine today, what should you do? Within the medical profession, that booth there, right there, we have people from our rehab facility. 
because a subspecialty within medicine is rehabilitation. It is a very unglamorous job. People who are less able, who are sick. When times are good, when we are clear, or rather you can, you, if you stand in front of the TV screen, that, that booth, you will see a video of a rehab facility. How we treat two to three hundred patients a day. I'm not promoting rehab right now, but I'm just saying across this in, within this industry, there is a sub-specialty which people should look into. If you can't make money as a GP, why not be a rehab person? Our chief uh, therapist, uh, Engwa, is there. Go talk to him about physiotherapy. Engwa will never be out of a job. Engwa will only be out of a job if his hands, his brain stopped working and he cannot recommend any therapy. Between Engwa and a medical doctor, I think Engwa is in far better demand. But whether they pay him that much, I don't know. But he is in demand. So, all these things, what do you do? Let me give you an example. The values that we saw in the value curve just now. The value curve. Where can you find some of these attributes? For example, I think just about everybody here walks into a fast food joint. Yesterday, I went down to the food shack just to get some nuggets. When we go, something we take for granted, buying our food or receiving our food, whether you go in person or you order for delivery, customer service. From the fast food guy, like in food shack, or bank personnel. How many of you have got stories to tell of your banking experience, calling a bank or going live? Good or bad, doesn't matter. Just put up your hands if you have banking experiences. Over Te Tare, you definitely want to tell me, oh yo, this bank, known for bad service, don't ever go there. I wonder why I go there. I mean, I, I dare not say anything. They might be here in this building, right? So, but some banks, when you go there, you say, wow. That person was spectacular. I read a book once about a, a businessman who took a holiday to Greece with his family. So he had his family with him, kids as well. They went to a restaurant, they ordered the food, and the son, the younger, the young kid says, I want a Coca-Cola. The waiter says, Sorry, sir. We serve Pepsi. We are contracted with Pepsi. And the kid goes, I want Coca-Cola. And then he hears the scent of it. Then he starts jumping around. And the guy says, Okay. Sir, he told the boy, I will get your Coca-Cola for you. And 10 minutes later, the Coca-Cola comes. And this businessman shared in the book. He asked, how do you get a Coca-Cola since you are contracted to uh, bound uh, to, by Pepsi? He said, just don't take a picture, don't post anywhere in social media. Uh, my manager is free. He's doing the accounts in a back room. I asked him to go to the 7-Eleven to buy the Coke. Now, wasn't that a spe isn't that a spectacular example of customer service? So when we look at such examples, then we ask ourselves, if I were to plot customer service on my value curve, how would I score? Customer service always stands out. And so on and so forth. Grooming. Zero, you have seen uh, Zetty is going to come, I'm sure. I'm sure Zetty is, I haven't met her before, but I'm sure she's dressed to the hilt because the management consultants know how to look very good. Because, like it or not, if I came up here, I, I was asked to wear this t-shirt, so I don't know whether it looks good or not. But, if I'm, I'm here supposed to be a management consultant to advise you what to do with your business or your business problem, would you have confidence in me if I dress like a dog? So rather than have the misconception that just because I dress lousy, I'm unkempt, I've got body odour and all these things, I would rather not let you think that I have a problem. 
or you have a problem with me. So I will dress well. So the management consultants, I, I look at, I and seriously, when I joined Accenture, I had a serious problem. My boss called me after the second week and said, Paul, yep, your work is good, but uh, your shirt looks like it needs to go for retreats. Retreats? He said, yeah, tire celup. Baju, baju you macam nak kena tire celup. Uh, I didn't understand. First time in my life, I was already 31 years old when I joined Accenture. And somebody says, my baju kena buat tak, macam tire celup. Another fellow told me, he said, go and get a new shirt. Because my collar here, the bulu bulu. Then my pants, sudah berkilat. Iron so many times until it shines on its own. Okay, so I had to spend money and get new clothes. And so on and so forth. Hygiene. Today, we see a lot of delivery fellows. When I see the delivery, delivery guys, grab riders, yes, they have a hard life and whatever, but I'm usually very impressed with a guy who has excellent hygiene. Personally, this is a personal beef. Uh, how you smell is very important. And it doesn't affect the fact that he, he or she has given me my food. But if the guy smells good, I give the guy a tip. Because in spite of Grab Rider, Sudha, Night Moto, 2, 3 jam, 4 jam, 5 jam, datang ke rumah saya, bau dia, hey, okay, I think that deserves $5. I just want to, then the guy said, what's the tip for? One solo, I gave him a $5 tip. The fellow said, that's for smelling nice. Oh, okay, thank you very much. So, all these attributes here, if you don't have them, where do you find them? This is what Blue Ocean is about. When you look at certain attributes which you like, sifat sifat yang bagus, mana kita boleh cari? Example two. Then you look at it, and then you have to ask yourself, now, how do I get that? Now, just now, uh, Mr. Ong is in this audience here, so I'll just use his name as an example. Mr. Ong, can you put up your hand just to wave? Mr. Ong specializes in data analytics. So sometime next week or so, we will have a call to see how we possibly can consider getting Mr. Ong's help to help computer science graduates. Computer science graduates, orang yang belajar computer science, boleh buat programming. Programming buat build app semua. App tu boleh kumpulkan data. Tapi, macam mana nak dapat maklumat selanjutnya dari data? That is data analytics. And within the university syllabus, probably data analytics is not a major thing to be thought. And maybe the lecturer has not, has not learned it himself or herself because it's a different science today. So, so when you look at some of these things, say, hmm, if you are interviewing for some of, how many of you here are employers or uh, your boss that interviews people, can you put up your hands? Nobody in this room interviews people. One, anybody, interviewer? Hey, Farah, don't lie. You interview people all the time, employment services. Okay. If you interview a computer science person, would you be interested in what the flow can program? Or what intelligence the guy knows how to pull out of data? The, the latter is the more important, right? So, things like that. Now, and another one would be Zero, fitness and nine. ability, fitness and skills. Uh, after my Form 6, I did my Form 6 in 1978. In those days, it was called the HSC. Now it's called the STPM. My friend said, hey, let's go apply for a job in case we don't qualify for university. Okay lah. So I applied, everybody else applied, police inspector. But because I was a reasonably good student and a school athlete, so I got interviewed there. And then the boss, banyak paku punya. School athlete. Tapi polis, you boleh lawan dengan orang jahat ke? So, uh, one of the things in life, because I, I'm from kampung, saya budak kampung. Kau tak tahu gaduh, kau tak tahu lawan, memang kena bully. Tapi kalau you belajar kung fu semua, nobody will touch you. So, by the time I was sixth form, I had a black belt in karate. 
just to take care of myself. But when I had the black belt in karate, I had no trouble. So what happened was this. So I told the boss, I said, yeah, I can. He said, what can you do? I said, then he had a corporal in the room, the guy who ushered us into the room. Corporal too, I said, okay. Minta tolong corporal try to attack me. Because I look at the corporal, he was a bit skinny. So I had a look at his hands. He didn't have the hands of a martial artist. So the corporal came through a punch, poop, three seconds, I put him down on the floor. I didn't, I didn't dare hit him. No. I got a job. Uh, I didn't become a policeman because I went to university. So now, why did I give that example? Some of these things, values, you can read, you can understand. But to be able to claim it and say, I'm good in it, some you have to go for a long-term course. Some you have to go and work there. So, for example, if you say customer service, customer service is not theory, you know. Kalau you, nanti kita perlu lapar, kita turunkan the, the ground floor there or the lower ground, nak beli barang, oh, customer service tu, gubuk sikit lah. Oh, oh, that one terror. If I put you there on the other side, do you think you can deliver straight away? Customer service perlu kan practice. So, if let's say, some of you just came in student, kan? Kalau ada peluang, you go and work with Mac, on Mac, in McDonald's every weekend. Two hours, two hours. Never mind the pay. Five dollars an hour. Don't worry about the money. Just go and work there. And after three months in McDonald's, your customer service will be like that. And when you put it dalam resume, saya kerja di McDonald's tiap-tiap um, hujung minggu, then I understand customer service, I understand this, understand that. That's how you add to your resume. So some of these values, other value nilai nilai ni, kita terpaksa kerja, dapat pengalaman. My youngest boy is 21 years old, he's doing the degree in MassCom. Next year he needs to, he's in final year, he, he needs three months of internship with the production house. So the night before the interview, he said that, how do I get this internship? Because they have a lot of candidates. So true enough, interviewer Tanya dear, why should I take you? My son is, he said, uh, told the employer, I think I can do whatever you want me to do. But if you have trouble deciding between me and another guy, I come for free. Okay, you're hired. Now, did I think of this? No, I did not think of this. This example came from Donald Trump, former president of the United States. He used, he is a billionaire. He runs his own company. He had this program called The Apprentice. Every year, he will find one apprentice to work for him. They are buyer gaji. The, the selection process, memang tough one. The smartest guys come. The salary of an apprentice, it's 240,000 US a year, 20,000 a month. So it's very competitive. So finally, do a wrong. Then one guy, he won. Donald Trump announced, okay, this is our apprentice, so and so, Mr. A. -A, -A. Then the second place one, Mr. Trump. He said, what has the loser got to say? You took him, you're going to pay him quarter million US a year? Yes, that's the price. If you take me, you can have me for free. So Donald Trump said, sorry, stand. Billionaire, memang kudukut. Now, how many of you bought tickets from Air Asia and trying to get the money? Cannot get the money back, right? Tony Fernandez is billionaire. Sama, they are billionaire, semua sama punya. So Donald Trump said, no, oh, you're fired. You have the job. So I look at the example I gave my son, and he's going to start his apprenticeship in January, thanks to Donald Trump. Now, there are other types of skills there and competencies. The, the purpose of this is not to say, 
this this is tetap benda ni memang tetap no nilai-nilai ni you have to look and see what is suitable for you you just need to ask yourself can i do more how do i make myself more employable because if you come out from university or college or whatever you equate syllabus to apa you dapat you don't get a value curve you get a sigil that says you have a diploma or you have a degree apa apa lah ijazah certificate sama ada certificate SPM uh, diploma atau itu saja you dapat it is not the role ikut bukan tanggungjawab university atau college atau sekolah untuk bagi you value curve yang lagi yang lengkap no you go to university college or school to get a specific qualification and you come up with that and does that guarantee you employability no so a call to action so uh, this one i i chew it from uh muhan penola it's a common term for management consultants this is the third aspect in blue ocean strategy there are three big models the value curve the six paths to blue ocean and this one the call to action what is this call to action kalau kamu tinjau apa nilai-nilai yang you boleh tawarkan kepada majikan or you you tawarkan nilai-nilai you sendiri you must see apa benda yang bagus tapi saya belum ada so you create for example if you like customer service tetapi as a student or where you're working right now you don't have an opportunity for customer service then you have to create buat saluran baru untuk dapat pengalaman ni even for keso people how do you have customer service you just volunteer to follow a squad prihatin around take leave for one week call mustafa daraman and i'm sure he will send you to or ismail abi he's downstairs Encik Ismail, can I follow your squad prihatin for one week and learn what is customer service like? Because the squad prihatin people go to our insured people and visit them, talk to them, Pachi, how are you and all these things. Especially they got a new wheelchair, they lost their legs, they got artificial limbs and all that. That is a lot of customer service. Okay? Now, you create. Some... You okay you should have start you are the benda tu tapi kena think naikkan lagi then you raise the level you do more you have to figure how to do more now some you should reduce below the standard just now muhan said you have to post in linkedin kalau you nak buat linkedin kan posting what did muhan say how often one a week ah something like that Now if you're posting 10 times a week maybe it's an, an addiction LinkedIn is good but too much of it can make it an addiction right so you have to reduce so non value adding na te tare it is good to go in exchange about the world news the the political landscape election coming there will be a lot of te tare sessions tapi kalau you kaki te tare tiap-tiap malam tak sempat nak belajar tak sempat nak buat apa-apa pun kena kurangkan then some of which you have to eliminate all together 0704 that time wasters unhealthy habits there's a counter at the back there arm forces kalau nak jadi askar Police is downstairs. You nak jadi askar, nak masuk navy, nak jadi paskal. But you smoke a lot, and if you drink, you might have to stop that because it's going to be very hard to get into the uniform units if you don't have. So this example. So kalau you buat empat benda ni, it will create a new value curve for you. So. What is important is this. Everyone, everyone, whether you are student or you're working, you need to continuously transform yourself. And what do you do? 
I recommend every three months you plot a new value curve. Every three months. So you start with here, X. So X is here. Academic, because you already got your degree. ECA, maybe cannot change because you finished school already. But for the other things, you can have, let's say, this D is for December, which is now. You plot your value curve in December. And then you pick some of these values that you want to improve. Then you chari, macam mana, activity, kerja part-time, volunteer ke apa-apa. Bulan March, you plot again. And at the end of March, see whether how you fare. Then, you chari lagi. How do you continuously improve and transform yourself? Then, this is bulan June atau July. Now, let me ask you this question. If you do this exercise over the next six months, And let's say this is how employee, this is your value curve. In six months' time, are you more employ employable? In six months' time, should your employer consider you for a promotion? Because seriously, for some of these skills, even if, let's say, how many of you can speak Mandarin? Boleh cakap belum? But Mandarin, one. So, two. Two Mandarin speaking in this room. Now, now, the two Mandarin speakers, keep your hands up. If I go for Mandarin class for three months, can I learn to speak and write some things? Three months, boleh? I'm still talking to two of you. Let's say it's language. Lah. In three months' time, would my value go up? For Mandarin in three months? Zero, eight, four, three. Sir, three months gole? Yes. Six months. One year can cari makan ready, correct? Two years can go to China to work ready. So, that is what I'm challenging you to do today. Some things need more time. Some things need Google only. Google and YouTube are one of the best things on this planet. And my last point today is this. We need role models. Like I told you, saya budak kampung. Mana saya tahu apa benchmark tu? So we need to know what the benchmarks are. So let's say, if I want to keep fit, Shohei Ono, Three gold med uh, world championships, two Olympic gold medals. Pound for pound, best judoka in the world right now. He has got train his training videos on the internet, how he trains. You look at his training during the MCO, you will get scared. Just now, Muihan was saying, you know, he was talking about the Bruce Lee, his last slide. He's worried Bruce Lee about the person who kicks 1,000 times. Shohei Ono practices... The uchimata, the technique to throw a person a thousand times a day, every day. So, Shohei Ono is one example. Here, these are special forces. Malaysia, kita call their Pascal for the army and police, UTK. In the US, you can apply to be considered for the special forces. But, to prepare to be fit enough for the, for the special forces, you have to train. You have to sign up for programs to be as fit enough to be a member of a special forces team. Zero, eight, three, nine. And so, in, you go to the internet, you can Google Navy SEALs training. There are people who offer that. So, if you want to have the discipline 
of to be fit or whatever. Go there and Google. Doesn't matter whether you want to be a police or soldier, but if you want to be super fit, you have to look at role models. If you want to look at sacrifice, Antoine Graceman, member of the last uh, World Cup Championship team for France. He had to leave his home at 12 years old to go to a football academy. Now I ask, tiap tiap orang di sini, kalau you nak meningkatkan employability kamu, kebolehan kamu, are you prepared to pay the price? Are you prepared to sacrifice? If you are not, you will be average. I'm sorry. Unless God bless you very unfairly, you are smart, you are this, you are that. Semua boleh lah. Okay lah. Some people are like very disgusting, but, but very small percentage. But for the most of us, normal human beings, my challenge to you is, are you prepared to sacrifice? Are you prepared to pay the price? And my last example for today, Emerald McRaven. He was a commander of the US Navy SEALs that went out and put an end to Osama. This is not a political statement, so I don't care whether it's right or wrong. He gives in his session, Admiral McRaven, in a commencement address to the University of Texas, he talked about 10 examples from the Navy SEALs. And one of the things he says is, make your bed every day. That kind of thing. It's funny, but it's very, very good. And it's one of the best commandment speeches in the world. I have two minutes. Does anybody have any questions for me, which I can try to answer? Nope. Okay. Thank you very much. Hand you back to the MC.